Yeah, Jamie Dimon. He's um, he's an interesting guy to follow or to keep up with or to to listen to because you know we we, we listen to investors like Warren Buffett or uh, late Charlie Munger or Monish Pabrai and because they're they're you know putting their money to work. But Jamie's a little bit different. I still listen to what he has to say, but in a different capacity. He's an interesting one because he is obviously the CEO of J.P. Morgan uh, and has been since 2006. Um, and J.P. Morgan is America's largest bank. It's got $3.4 trillion in assets. So he's a very uh, important... I don't know if he's an important figure in the economy, but he's someone that will see everything. He, he's privy to a lot of information and he analyzes a lot of information about the economy. Um, so it's yeah. a very interesting read. Um, it's a long letter, so I'm really going to condense this. Um, there were a few themes in his letter. Uh, the first one that he uh, decided to address was uh, AI. Um, so he said, while we do not know uh, the full effect or the precise rate at which AI will change our business or how it will affect society at large, we are completely convinced the consequences will be extraordinary. The impact will, quote, possibly be as transformational as some of the major technological inventions of the past several hundred years. Think the printing press, the steam engine, electricity, computing, and the internet. So it, he's definitely... Yeah. Uh, I don't know. He de- he's someone that definitely thinks there's a huge amount of hype and speculation in terms of AI in the stock market. But in terms of a technology, he is quite bullish. And it's also, he said, that something that they are looking to embrace at JP Morgan. So he said, yeah. uh, JP Morgan now has more than 2,000 AI and machine learning employees and, data, and uh, data scientists working on 400 applications, including fraud detection, marketing, and risk controls. Uh, The bank is also exploring the use of generative AI in software engineering, customer service, and ways to boost employee productivity. So he's Mm. definitely definitely bullish on on AI, Hamish. Yeah, I think there's just so many parallels to, to, you know, late 80s, early 90s internet. And if you look back and watch interviews or or news kind of uh, like 60-minute kind of segments on, on the internet in like 1993... It gives you a fascinating insight um, because there's so many parallels to the things that people are saying about AI today. And, um, mm. and so, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be uh, shocked to put it in that list with like steam engine, electricity, the internet. Um, I think it certainly fits in yeah. there. I think there's only a few times in our lives where your mind is really blown. Like when, when you look at something and you go, holy moly, that is crazy. Yeah. And I think the first time I heard about ChatGPT, I was like, all right, sure, this was this like glorified Google search or something like that. And then I can't remember who showed it to me for the first time. But then as soon as you start using it and you're seeing it really, really seeing the power of what it can do, that it can talk to you, like what it can recommend, that was, that was one of those moments that I was like, wow, this is something really that we have never seen before you Mm. know a lot of products and technology is kind of just like iterations or building off of something else it's kind of like this but a little bit different you know but this was something where i was like wow this is this is new and this is really interesting no of course i don't buy into the ai hype of the stock market and that kind of stuff i think it's going to be a long grind before Mm. and a lot of time and energy put into building ai but uh, it's something that's very interesting yeah i think yeah. promotes a lot of philosophical debates like is AI <laughs> once we have AI is that the last invention that humanity ever needs to make mm. yeah interesting question sorry yeah, Amish, I, I cut I, you off I, no 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 you're fine I think um I think for me that moment was was uh watching some of the videos coming out of Sora or open AI Sora um with their mm. text to video which is not released yet but there's been some demos kind of released and that is just insane I mean that's just something we've never seen before and it opens up so many possibilities for uh Mm. creating you know video games creating movies creating content in the future um it it, for the first time i realized how much content creation or just film is gonna change in in the next 10 or 20 years um and it's so early that's the thing that got me with that video service what's it called sora is that it was generating sure you could see it was a little bit wonky and oftentimes it is wonky but it's so early and it's already so impressive that give it a few years and it's gonna blow our minds i'm sure yeah 
Um, okay, moving beyond AI, uh, Diamond also discussed inflation. He discussed the potential soft landing for the economy, he discussed interest rates, commercial real estate, bank regulation, social media, media, and geopolitical risks. So oh. we'll go through each one. On inflation, he said, many key economic indicators today continue to be good and possibly improving, including inflation. But when looking ahead to tomorrow, conditions that will affect the future should be considered. All of the following factors appear to be inflationary ongoing fiscal spending, remilitarization of the world, restructuring of global trade, capital needs of the new grain economy, and possibly higher energy costs in the future due to a lack of needed investment in the energy infrastructure. So, mm. Diamond, I mean, he said this before, but he definitely kind of takes the stance of, oh, guys, this inflation piece might not be over. Like, it's great if it is, but remember, it's probably not. And yeah. these are the reasons for it. Yeah, yeah and I think... Um I think it's interesting. It's an interesting time because there are so many factors on the inflationary and on the deflationary side that are just out there mm. at the moment. Like a big one that I think doesn't probably even get enough recognition is AI and how uh, big technological advancements that reduce costs in a sharp way, like the internet, like the steam engine, are extremely deflationary. Um, right. If everyone mm -hmm. suddenly has to have way less labor and their costs go down, that puts d massive downward pressure on prices. And it's been one of the biggest deflationary factors of the last 20 years has been the Internet and how much that has and computing as well, if you want to go back another 20 years. But those two technological advancements have put an enormous amount of downward pressure on inflation. And so yep. uh, while there are a lot of inflationary factors out there, like, yeah, if countries are uh, increasing their military, that's more spending. If governments are spending more money, that's going to be more debt and more inflation. There are a lot of inflationary factors out there, but we do have this, this kind of technology that we have no idea how much, how many jobs it's going to, uh, how much it's going to remove the need for a lot of jobs um, and, and the deflationary impact that that potentially has. So... Um, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating time. It is. Long-term technology is deflationary. You think about it even like it's everything, all technology starts out expensive and then it gets better and better and it gets cheaper and cheaper. So yep. it makes things easier, it gets better. Yeah, you're right. It is deflationary. So you do have those two forces at play. Um, which one is more powerful than the other? That remains to be seen, I guess. Um, yeah. Diamond also spoke about the potential for a soft landing. So this 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 phrase gets chucked around a lot, um, but nobody ever really talks about exactly what it means. So a, a soft landing, I looked it up. A soft landing really means that there's there's been a rise in interest rates, so therefore there's a slowdown of the economy, but the slowdown of the economy, that you kind of get through it without causing a big recession. That's what's known as a right. soft landing in economics. So on that, Diamond says, equity values by most measures are at the high end of the valuation range and credit spreads are extremely tight. These markets seem to be pricing in at a 70 to 80% chance of a soft landing, modest growth along with declining inflation and interest rates. I believe the odds of that, are, sorry, I believe the odds are a lot lower than that. So... Yeah. Again, Diamond taking a slightly more bearish stance. And I think he kind of does that, not not to just be a perma bear, but he, he kind of gets, I feel like Jamie kind of gets a little bit annoyed at the market speculators, the people that buy NVIDIA like at the current price, like that kind of stuff. So he kind of likes to kind of, niggle at them and be like, hey guys, we need to like really chill out because things could be worse than you think. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, I mean, you do, you do get these times, right, where the market kind of swings back and forth from optimism and pessimism. And it's certainly, um, you know, depending on who you ask, you could, some people will say it's an absolute bubble at the moment. Some people just say it's slightly kind of optimistic, but certainly I think everyone can agree markets are optimistic uh, on balance. Um, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, if you're, if you're someone like Jamie Dimon or even a Ray Dalio, or you know, I, I tend to kind of put myself in this camp as well, it kind of makes me nervous when markets are on the optimistic side. I like when they're on the pessimistic side because then, you know, there's upside surprise. Um, but when there's on the optimistic side, especially with so many, you know, macroeconomic factors that have unknown outcomes, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of a, you know, walking in, in, in darkness. 
Yeah. Uh, two more things, Hamish, on interest rates and commercial real estate. Um, Diamond said, if long long end rates, that's long term or ten year government bonds, go up over six percent, and this increase is accompanied by a recession, there will be plenty of stress, not just in the banking system, but with leveraged companies and others. Remember, a simple two percentage point increase in rates essentially reduced the value of most financial assets by twenty percent. And certain real estate assets, specifically office real estate, may be worth even less due to the effects of recession and higher vacancies. Mm-hmm. So he, he sees some potential issues brewing if um, if interest rates stay up. And then finally on geopolitics, um, he does like to weigh in on geopolitics, Jamie <laughs> Dimon. He likes to have his say. He says, quote, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the subsequent aberrant attack on Israel and ongoing violence in the Middle East should have punctured many assumptions about the direction of future safety and security, bringing us to this pivotal time in history. America and the free Western world can no longer maintain a false sense of security based on the illusion that dictatorships and oppressive nations won't use their economic and military powers to advance their aims, particularly against what they perceive as weak, incompetent, and disorganized Western democracies. In a troubled world, we are reminded that national security is and always will be paramount, even if its importance seems to recede in tranquil times. So he's not sure. I find that interesting, like chucking quotes like that in, in your JP Morgan annual <laughs> report and letter to shareholders. But yeah, Jamie Dimon, I think he's just getting so comfortable that he, he just likes to just chuck his own opinions in there. But um, it's yeah. uh, he said that as well as a tricky time, a tricky time for the global economy and global supply chains, specifically because of all of these geopolitical risks. Right. Yeah. Interesting. I'm not sure um, if I have anything uh, too much to add on uh, geopolitics in the Middle East. So. What? Yeah. You, sorry. <laughs> Can you give me your nuanced opinion on the, the conflict in the Middle East, Hamish? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Okay. Um, yeah. We are definitely drifting outside yeah. our lane when it comes to that. So that that's pretty much what Jamie Dimon had to say in his letter to shareholders. 